first of all, I'm really humbled uh, that you have a lot of good sessions to attend to and you decided to come here. So hopefully you'll get uh, the things I'm talking about and hopefully you're going to understand how AI is going to be used in software testing. My name is Raj Subramanian and a little bit about my company and what I do. So I work for a company called testim.io, T-E-S-T-I-M.io. What we do is we have an AI-based software testing tool uh, which helps to do front-end testing, UI testing, and end-to-end -end testing. And uh, coming to my role, um, just like Gil, who was giving the presentation before, I'm a developer evangelist, which means that um, I write about software testing, speak about software testing, and also uh, work with the founder of my company to make our tool better for our customers, right? And also work with the customers directly to help them use our tool, especially when it comes to code and stuff. And I have a background of Selenium. I did seven years of uh, Cucumber, Java, and Appium, so I kind of uh, know the framework pretty well. So that's about me. So today I'm going to cover these topics uh, as part of this talk, right? So I'm going to talk about what are the current challenges with software testing, then how AI can help to solve these challenges. And before getting to how AI can solve these challenges, I may cover the basics of AI. Um, I know in a previous presentation, uh, Gil mentioned a couple of stuff about uh, basics of AI, but I want to make sure when I use AI terminology, everyone is on the same page um, when I talk about AI, deep learning, art, um, machine learning, and stuff like that. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the future of AI, and there are some of the things, those are some of the things which we are currently working on as well. So for, let's set some context, right? So even before talking about what are the problems AI can solve, it's really important to understand how software uh, testing has evolved in the past few decades, right? So I know for people in the end, it may be hard to see, but uh, in the 1980s and 1990s period, right, um, testing was predominantly manual testing, and um, we had um, uh, teams which used to deliver, which used to build the product for like six months, and then finally they'll give it to the uh, tester saying, hey, test this, right? They've, so pretty much the uh, development methodology was waterfall, and what happened was there was a lot of wastage of time, cost, and effort because what the tester will find a bug, and then once he reported, a lot of rework had to happen, and then a lot of changes happened, and because of that, people started missing deadlines, and the customers didn't get their product on time, right? So that's how software testing was in 1980s and 90s. And then from 1990 to 2003, we started seeing these bulky automation tools which started cropping up, right? Testers were super happy that, man, finally we have something which could help us in testing. But the problem was they were so bloated and it was really hard to understand what they're actually trying to do, right? And it was a steep learning curve. And at the same time, uh, we started seeing people experimenting with different development approaches, right? Like RAD, which is rapid application development, then Scrum, XP, and those kind of approaches. So that's what happened in the period of 1990 to 2003. Then we come to the 2003-2010 period. This was the period of um, innovation, I would say, because uh, the open source framework started during that time. And there was this uh, group of like-minded people um, who wanted to solve different problems with software testing, right? And, and what they encourage other people in the community to help them solve problems with software testing. So one example of an open source framework would be Selenium. So that kind of started during that time, right? And, and so we started seeing a lot of these uh, open source communities forming during the 2003, 2010 period. At the same time, people got tired of waterfall uh, way of uh, developing software, right? So Agile became huge. So we had Scrum, XP, and people wanted to release uh, software fast, right? They wanted to write this fast, 
find bugs faster and really, really, really fast. So that was 2003, 2010 period. And then we had 2010 to the current period which we are in right now where everything's about scale. So what do I mean by that? So as the software is becoming really complex, right, um, there's a need for a lot of uh, server space, faster processing, parallel execution, uh, 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 and you have so many resources uh, which you need, right, as your testing complexity increases. So in this era, from 2003 till now, there were two things which have made a big impact in our software testing industry. So one is crowd testing, where people uh, realized that um, collaboration was really important. And what they did was they gave their uh, applications to other passionate testers outside the company to get feedback about their application, right? So crowd testing was one big thing which started. And another thing which happened during the same time was cloud testing. Because we had server space, faster processing, need for parallel execution, we have SaaS labs and other Amazon cloud and all those people have come into play. So those are the two big things which have happened. So that's the current state, right? Now, it's all about the future. The future is going to be autonomous testing using machine learning and AI. Um, it's not going to be about static locators. It's going to be about dynamic locators, right? And I'm going to talk about that in a bit. I'm going to talk about that in detail with the demo as well. And, and it's all about increasing collaboration, making automation simple, smarter, faster, and more stable. So that's the period we are going to see, and that's going to be the future, right? So it's important to get this context, uh, and it makes sense as and when I go through the slides. So let's talk about the current challenges with software testing, right? So recently, uh, we did a survey um, in terms, we asked people how frequent, how frequently they release software, right? A majority of them, uh, they start testing early, but they keep testing, right, until the last minute, and because of that, a lot of times, release cycles are getting affected, and then they're not able to release uh, software in time, right? 57% were uh, responded to that. And finally, at the bottom, we see 2% of the people who are releasing every minute of every day, right? Now, if you're going to transfer this into a graph, this is how it's going to look like. So we have the laggards in one end who release software every six months, right? And then we have the innovators on the other end who are releasing software really frequently every day, right? So let's talk about challenges in each of these phases, and then you're gonna understand how AI is gonna help to solve these challenges in each of these phases, right? So the first challenge is the challenge of skill set. So people uh, who are in the laggards phase, uh, who release only every six months, they have this challenge of skill set where getting skilled testers is really hard and, and, and it takes a lot of time and it's very expensive, right? And that's because of that challenge, pr uh, most of the testing is manual and it just takes so much time for them to release a product, right? So that's the laggard space. Then you have the late majority phase where uh, there are people who release product, uh, who do the releases every month, but they have this huge challenge of authoring, right? So what do I mean by that? These are organizations who have testers, they have some skilled testers, and they start authoring tests, but they fail to notice and pay attention to good practices of automation like reusability, low coupling, parameterization, and all those things which you need to keep in mind while doing automation, they fail to realize it. And because of that, there's a lot of problems, and they end up only releasing once a month. Then you have the early majority of folks who, majority of them who have released once in two weeks, and they have this huge problem of initialization state, right? So what do I mean by that? Say um, you have written 10 tests right now, and then it's all passing, you're super happy, yay, right? Then next day you come, you need to notice that all the 10 tests are failing right now. So what happened? The 
problem was the state of the app application actually changed and now all the dentists are failing, right? That's because a lot, majority of those problems are because of the initial, initial state of the application, right? So say for example, you have Amazon and you have an automation script which says uh, you have to add I items to the cart, right? So you write an automation script which add items to the cart and awesome, the test passed. Now you rerun the test, the same exact test. What's gonna happen is it's going to add another item. Now there'll be two items in the cart. You rerun the test, three items in the cart, four items in the cart, it keeps going, right? People fail to realize that you need to make sure the app is in the initial state. Like you have to have zero items in the cart before running your test again, right? So similar to your login scenario, logout scenario. Once you log into the application, you, you want to make sure you log out, right? So people fail to realize this initial state which causes a majority of your problem, right? So that is the third challenge. Fourth challenge is maintenance. And that's the biggest problem you're facing right now with, which is test maintenance, right? So say now we have 500 tests, right? And uh, it takes about five hours to run it. And then only to find out that like 100 tests are failing. Now what, what do you do? You actually have to go look at every freaking test which is there, then troubleshoot it, put a fix, and rerun it, wait for another five hours. So there's this huge problem of maintenance, right? And a majority of the people uh, have the exact maintenance problem. And that's one thing which I'm going to talk about, how we are trying to solve it and how other companies are trying to solve the maintenance problem using AI. So I'm going to talk about that. And finally, scale. I already talked about scale where we need server space and you want to run more tests as frequently as possible. So these are the current challenges uh, with software testing and test automation in general. So I'm going to talk about how AI is going to help to solve all these challenges which I just talked about. So before I do that, I wanted to cover the basics of AI just in three, four minutes because people are mystified by this word AI. They use AI, machine learning, deep learning, and I know in our previous talks they mentioned a couple of differences between these two, but I wanted to make it simple, right? By no means I'm an AI expert, but it's really simple if you understand the concept. So I'm going to just cover that quickly. So you have this huge circle, right? And the outer circle is called artificial intelligence, this huge space. So what is artificial intelligence? It is giving the ability for machines to work and react like human beings, right? That's artificial intelligence. Under artificial intelligence, you have machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is the field of study which gives the machines the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, right? So that is machine learning. And, and, and it evolved from the study of computational theory, which is study of learning algorithms and pattern rec recognition. So that's how machine learning evolved. So that is machine learning, right? And now, whatever you hear in the media and for the past four years about autonomous cars and everything related to AI, a majority of them is related to, related to deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. And, and so what is deep learning? Again, uh, some of you may already know, but deep learning is mapped to the neural network of human beings. So you have these different neurons which starts interacting with each neuron in your human body and then gives re reactions and uh, makes you act in a certain way because all these neur neurons are learning from each other. So they took that to machines and that's what is deep learning, right? And all your autonomous cars and whatever you're hearing about right now is all deep learning. To give you a very simple example of how it works, so say for example, um, you want to, uh, you're giving the size uh, of a house you want and the price you have to pay for it. And when, so you give this input and then price is the output. So what, the input output combination is called a training set. So whenever you meet any AI folks, they're gonna talk about training set is just giving input and output combinations for the AI to learn to train the AI, right? So say you, you give the size and the price and you wanna see what the AI comes up with, right? So first you give the size and the price and then you give the number of bedrooms, right, and the price, then the AI starts figuring out, you know what, 
family size is something you want to think about based on the inputs you have given. And then you start giving zip code, then AI is going to determine, AI is going to find a relationship called how walkable, you know, that area is, right? It's trying, figuring out based on all these input output combination. Then you give the wealth and the price of the house, then it's going to figure out the school quality. So, so all these things in the middle, those are, that's what the AI does. And it's a black box and I'll, I'm just giving a really simple example of how AI could figure something out, but that's how it is. So you give all the inputs and the outputs and then keep training the AI and then it's going to find a lot of relationships, right? So that is deep learning and that's how uh, it works. And your autonomous cars, that's an example for deep learning. And these autonomous cars, you're hearing it in the past three, four years, but the first research was done way back in 1989 at Stanford University. And in fact, they had a uh, video of them training an autonomous car. Um, uh, the car's name was Alvin. So this is a video from it. So if you see, they're training it. Alvin is a system of artificial neural networks that learns to steer by watching a person drive. Alvin is... to control the NavLab 2 that learns to steer by watching a person drive. Alvin is designed to control the NavLab 2, a modified Army Humvee equipped with sensors, computers, and actuators for autonomous navigation experiments. The initial step in configuring Alvin is training a network to steer. During training, a person drives the vehicle while Alvin watches. Once every two seconds, Alvin digitizes a video image of the road ahead and records the person's steering direction. In 30 by 32 pixels and provided as input to Alvin's three-layered network. Using the backpropagation learning algorithm, Alvin is trained to output the same steering direction as the human driver for that image. Initially, the network steering response is random. After about two minutes of training, the network learns to accurately imitate the steering reactions of the human driver. Pushes the run switch, and Alvin begins driving. 12 times per second, Alvin digitizes an image and feeds it to its neural networks. Each network, running in parallel, produces a steering direction and a measure of its confidence in its response. The steering direction from the most confident network in this case, the network train for the one-lane road is used to control the vehicle. As the vehicle approaches the intersection, the confidence of the one-lane network decreases. crosses the intersection and the two-lane road ahead comes into view, the confidence of the two-lane network rises. When its confidence rises, the two-lane network is selected to steer, safely guiding the vehicle into its lane on the two-lane road. So this research was, this video was published in 1982 and we just hear about autonomous cars for for the past four years, right? So um, the reason I was um, stressing on the confidence level and uh, the data we provide to the AI is because I'm gonna show a demo of how people are using AI in software testing. And you're gonna see all these concepts, the exact same thing 
reflecting in the tool as well. Um, so I just wanted to give you an idea that artificial intelligence was not something new. So for you to um, in uh, with, to see how you can train an AI in live, there there's an open source um, application called QuickDraw. Has have any of you heard of QuickDraw from Google? So that's the best example of how you can actually keep training AI. So based on the things you draw, the AI keeps learning, right? And that's the best example for you to know how an AI actually works. So I have a de example for that too. So once I get out of this, so it's called Quick Draw. And if you go, so this is how it's going to look like. So you're going to draw different things and train the AI. And anyone can do this. This best example of uh, deep learning here. So you click on let's draw. Now it's a draw a guitar, right? Or garden hose, or belt, or speedboat. I see key. Oh, I know. It's guitar. So you just train. You're training the AI right now. Now you have to draw a crab. That is going to be a tough one, actually. I'm really bad. At I see circle, or blueberry, or bracelet, or teapot. I see frying pan, or sea turtle, or spider. I'm stumped. <laughs> see, so yeah, my drawing is really bad, right? Um, so you're actually training the AI right now. And Sorry, I couldn't it. guess it. Now you let's try a pair. I see moon or ear or circle. I see apple or cherry. How do you do a pair, man? So I'm stumped. <laughs> so okay, we'll just try one last one. I want something to be successful. So Sorry, I couldn't guess it. Okay, I can draw a pencil for sure. I see line, or hockey stick, or magic wand, or string bean. I see the Eiffel Tower, or wishbone, or baseball bat. Oh, I know, it's pencil. Exactly, right? So, so that's, that's AI live in action, right? So that's an open source uh, drawing tool. And um, Google, that's how stumps you, gets all this freaking data, because now I'm using it for the presentation. So they keep getting data for free, and they're training the AI, right? So. Just want to give you an idea about how an AI works and what are the concepts behind it, right? So now that you have this idea of the different challenges we have and how AI works and what AI is, so I'm going to talk about how we use AI in software testing, right? So like, um, there are different companies trying to do different things uh, using AI. Um, but one thing, remember, at the start of the presentation, I was say, saying the future is going to be moving from static IDs to uh, dynamic locators. So I'm going to talk about that for a bit. So at TestM, in my company, we use what is called dynamic locators. And what that means is um, we get multiple attributes for every single element using AI, which is working underneath the hood, right? So for example, say um, you have a login button and you write a Selenium script and say, I click on login, right? And uh, you're super happy and the next day you come and see the test fail because some developer just decided to change the name of the login to summit and the test fails, right? And you're super pissed, you have to take time to troubleshoot the issue, then you find the problem and then you rerun the test, right? And then there's so much time waste over there. So that's where we bring the concept of dynamic locators and that's going to be the future of software testing and that's what people have started using. So for the same example of login button, what happens is this AI underneath the hood, it's going to go through the DOM and extract all the object trees and properties and create a list of location strategies, right? So for the same example of login button, if you're going to change the name of login to summit, the test is not going to fail. The reason is we already have a list of location strategies which the AI created. So it's going to say, oh, wait a minute, the name changed. You know what, I'm not going to fail the test. Let's go to the next best location strategy, which could be ID, right? If the ID had changed, it'll say, you know what, let's go to the next next uh, next best location strategy, which could be tag. Then CS says, keep going on and on. Because for every single attribute, it gets mul every single element, it gets multiple attributes, right? That's what dynamic locators is. and that's what we use on our tool. So to show you a live example of how it actually works, um, 
it's, and this is how people are using dynamic locators in their testing, right? So let me take an example here. Okay, so this, this is how our tool looks like. Let's just start uh, creating a test, right? So I'm gonna create new. Um, I'm just gonna start recording a test. So I had to re refresh because I think I'm having poor internet connection. So give me a second. And I know with live demos, there's always, uh, there's gonna be a hit or a miss. So I have a recorded video too. So I come prepared. Um, but you know what, let's uh, just try this out. Because I know everyone is on the Wi-Fi connection right now. So um, it's taking some time. Cool, okay. So right now we have the editor. Um, let's see whether it works now, so. Cool, so I'm just recording a test, right? This is a demo application I, we created. And I'm just gonna click on login, enter username, password, click on the login button. Um, I'm gonna select dates from a date picker, just because I can. And then um, I'm gonna click on the select destination button and then uh, in, in the bottom, you have a book button. I'm gonna click on that, um, enter my name, email address, and I think that should be enough for now. So, so as you can see, um, the AI underneath our uh, platform, it actually records all the steps with the screenshots and actually displays it over here, right? But coming to the part which I wanna talk about is the dynamic locators which I'm talking about, right? So say for example, let's take the select destination button. So here you can see the list of location strategies which all the DOM elements have been parsed and then displayed over here for the select destination button, right? So what the AI has done is in real time, as and when I was interacting with the element, it just, just parsed all the attributes of that element and displayed over here. So you can see the text attribute, um, indexes, then you also have class, tags, and everything. There's multiple attributes of the same element. And remember I was talking about the scoring in the video? That's because we use a similar kind of algorithm. Here um, I'm hovering over the stars next to each attribute, and the AI says that uh, the score for the text attribute is 0.9, which is the highest you can get. So it probably is going to use the text attribute to locate that element. But say if we change the text to something else, then it's going to go to the next special location strategy, which could be class or type, because both have the same scoring. But it makes the decision in real time. So to show you a live example of, even if you change an attribute, the test will continue to run because of the AI. So I'm going to do something over here. Um, so I'm going to put a breakpoint um, next to the, at the point where we click on the select destination button, before we click on the select destination button, and then I'm gonna change the attributes of select destination, and then I'm gonna show you how the AI actually smartly figures this change. So I'm gonna run this test. Um, it's gonna run the test uh, until the point it's gonna click the select destination button. So it's gonna click on login, enter my username, um, password, click on the login button, go through the dates from the date picker, Cool, and then now the test reached a breakpoint because I haven't clicked the select destination button yet, right? And so now you see this loading icon, which means that, okay, there's a breakpoint, that's cool. So now, okay, so now I'm going to manipulate this uh, attribute of the select destination. So I'm gonna do an inspect. And don't worry, if the demo fails, again, I have a recording too, but um, I'm gonna, me just move. Whoa. What do you guys see? Okay. So I'm going to move this button. Say I'm going to move it to a location. So if you see, I just moved the select destination button from here to here. And 
to make it uh, better, I could do another thing. I'm going to change the name of the button from Select Destination to Selenium Conference 2018, right? Okay, so if this was the situation in most of the automation tools you use, what's going to happen when you run the test? It's going to fail, right? Exactly, because I pretty much did every freaking thing possible to this button so that it should surely fail. But now see what happens um, when I run this test, right? So I'm going to click on play, and there you go. It just still keeps running. It's going to continue the test, enter my username, email address, and just keeps going, right? And let's see what happened underneath the hood. So again, going back to the select destination button. So I don't know whether you guys noticed, but before it was 100% confidence, but now the confidence level decreased to 83% because I manipulated the attributes. And what actually happened was, um, that since I changed the text attribute and the location, it went to the next best location strategy, which could be, again, class or tag, and then it made the decision real time, right? And, and in, it takes screenshots and actually shows you um, that, hey, you had this button, but the attribute changed, but the functionality didn't change. So I continue to run the test, but I just want to let you know. So, so it's telling you with screenshots. So for example, the baseline image was select destination, but um, what it found was Selenium Conference 2018, right? So that's the beauty of using dynamic locators. So when, once you extract multiple attributes of the same uh, element, right? So the test becomes more stable, um, and, and, and when you have 500 tests and next day you come, you don't have to worry about like, oh man, 250 tests fail, and now I have to put 24 hour days to actually fix it, right? So you don't have to worry about it. So that's the beauty of dynamic locators, and that's what people are using right now to, and that's gonna be the future of uh, testing. People are gonna move from static locators to dynamic locators. And, Everything is possible, all this is possible because the AI underneath the hood. So it's a good thing, at least for test automation, right? So that's why I just wanted to show you a live example of how dynamic locators work. So that's going to be the next best thing. So this is the coverage gap in software testing right now. So the complexity of uh, different features of the software are increasing exponentially, but the tests are growing only linearly, right? So we have this huge gap in between, and that's what AI can help to solve, right? So that's something you wanna keep in mind. Now coming to the future of AI, and some of the things I'm gonna mention, uh, we are actually trying to do in our company right now, but again, it's a work in progress because as I said, AI is a black box. We need to figure out a lot of stuff of how it's reacting to different input-output combinations, right? So let's first talk about autonomous testing. So what's going to happen is, and what we're trying to do in our company, and I know a couple of other companies are doing the same, is we're going to connect our production apps to our software testing cycle, right? So what does it mean? So the AI is going to start observing different flows which the actual production users are trying to do with your apps, and it's going to create tests based on the actual flows, right? And it's going to create tests for you. And it's also going to identify, identify repeated steps, like logging in, logging out, and it's going to cluster them for us. It's going to create reusable components automatically for us, right? And uh, we do it to a certain extent right now, but we still uh, want to get to the point where we can start analyzing production user flows and create tests. And finally, you have this tests which are created based on actual production data, and that's autonomous testing, and that's what everyone wants to get to, right? And, and, and this is what we are trying to do right now uh, with uh, using AI. So the next one is, um, UI TDD. So everyone has heard about ATDD, BDD, all the DDs out there, but 
there's one more T uh, T T D D to make it more complex, which is called UI test UI based test driven development. So what do we mean by that, right? So what's going to happen is so we have these mockups and the uh, and developers. So in general, at least in companies I've worked with, worked in for the past 12, 12 years, we usually have mockups, and then the developers will look at the mockups and say, "Oh, this is a feature. Okay, let me start developing." Right? Now with AI, what you can do is while the developers are developing the feature based on uh, these mockups, the AI can look at these images and start creating tests for us, right? Based on the features. So you're going to, so the AI is going to create the test based on the mockups. The developer is going to develop the feature using the mockups. And then finally, once the feature is developed, you run the tests which were already created by the AI and make sure it's green, right? So now you have UI based test driven development, right? And uh, currently we are working on this aspect um, of trying to do UI based test driven development, right? It's super fun, but it, yeah, we again need a lot of data. Uh, probably I should do something like quick draw and make you guys do something so that I can collect some data. But the point is, yeah, this is another thing which we are trying to do right now. So f finally, another big thing is automatic response. So every time uh, you make a change in your UI, say for example, you change something in the login flow in the UI, right? You don't just go change, just t test the UI. You also want to make sure that the uh, response and request response to servers and database still continue to work. Because the developer would say, no, I didn't change anything. But of course, we as testers don't agree to that. And we would want to test that whole end-to-end -end flow, right? Um, so say, for example, uh, something changed the login in the UI, right? Before, what you have to do is you have to wait for the server uh, to process the request. It, it will probably uh, access another database, maybe, and then give the necessary information. And then in the response, finally, we get in the UI. And that was a part of, that was a little time consuming aspect of testing as well. But with AI, what's going to happen is the AI is going to record all the server responses and requests, and we're going to mock it. So you don't have to go all the way from a server to another server to another database, get the, get the request, uh, get the response back and back to the UI. You don't have to wait for that. Even that time can be saved by marking, uh, recording all these server responses. And then based on whatever you do, it based on the marked responses, it, you immediately start getting feedback, right? And it makes your test much, much faster, right? So, that is something um, which people are working on currently, and that's one of the things we are working as well using AI. So how companies like us and other people are trying to use AI to you know, pave the way for the future, right? So our main focus is on um, solving the challenges which currently exist with test automation. The main thing is the maintenance aspect of it. So that's what we're currently working on. But also, autonomous testing helps eliminate the quality velocity dilemma. So what do I mean by that? So in terms of quality, so you are, now you've already created all the user flows based on the actual production data, right? So you're maximizing user coverage because the, you're actually mimicking what the users are really doing, right? So now, the, so all of a sudden, now QA has become a science, and we make decisions based on all this data, right? We make risk-based, uh, base, we uh, based on, base our decision based on risks and data. And, and the biggest thing is you're already ahead of the curve, because the, what the AI does is it proactively finds problems and keeps fixing them in the background, even before it comes to, uh, comes to the screen or you see it, right? That is because of the self-healing mechanism of the AI, because it, it, can, it just keeps doing its own thing, right? And we, can, we don't have to worry about a lot of stuff. So that's why it prevents bugs as opposed to fixing them. Then coming to the velocity aspect, 
So we create much more scenarios in a short period of time, right? Because all these tests are automatically created for us. Of course, we as human testers, we'll go and check whether that's what you actually needed, right? That's why there's always a human who needs to be there. But the point is, you can create much more scenarios. Um, you can create this proactively by monitoring production apps, and it's easier to do root cause analysis as well. So those were pretty much the things I wanted to actually cover. Um, hopefully, now we got an idea about what the basics of AI is, how people are using AI for software testing, what are dynamic locators, and how the AI actually use the dynamic locators to make decisions in real time. So that's what you, uh, everyone is seeing right now. If you need uh, more information, I have my email address and everything over here. And uh, before this talk, I al already wrote a summary of all the things I talked about and I also have extra information about tools and programming language people are using in this blog post. So once, um, if you just um, go to uh, testim.io and click on blog, you should be able to see that. I, or if you have this um, slide, if you just click on it, it'll take you right there, right? And before I end the session, so I wanted to do a couple of things, right? Um, I, I know we have time, so what's the time? Okay, we have five minutes left. So I wanted to do two things, right? Um, first thing is I uh, never uh, realized that uh, there'll be such a big crowd, which is phenomenal. So I'm gonna take a selfie and you guys should say, hey, or something, and just wanna prove to people that there were actually people in my <laughs> talks. So, <laughs> say cheese. Cheese. Okay, that is one thing. And another thing is I got some freebies. Um, so we have uh, test and t-shirts over here. So feel free to take them. And I didn't, again, no, didn't know there were these many people, so it's like a first come, first of basis. And I have one request though. Once you take the t-shirt, I would like you to just wear them and then we'll take a group picture and then we can blow up Twitter as well. So, um, so that's pretty much it. And thanks for sitting there patiently and thank you. And I'll take questions right now. Hi Raz, uh, my question is that you were talking about the dynamic locators. So in the application that I test, what happens is uh, we have elements and most of the CSS, the developers, what they do is uh, from the CSS, uh, everything is almost same, right? And the ID is dynamic. So in my application, if I have two buttons uh, with the same name, just their position is uh, different, right? Uh, are you getting what I'm trying to ask? So, so, so uh, if the if the buttons are placed differently, but the CSS and the X path almost it's same, just the position is different, and the ID is dynamic. So uh, just as you showed in the demo, uh, somehow the developers somehow uh, 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 interchange the the location of the uh, buttons interchanged. So the functionality of the buttons is different. So in that case, will it detect that the uh, buttons has changed, or will it click the same button? I mean, because the uh, it the position of the buttons has just interchanged, no? Right, so just to make sure um, I got the question right, say you have four buttons called Summit, and all four <laughs> buttons have exact same CSS, uh, tag names, everything's the same. Even the IDs are same? No, the IDs are dy dynamic, okay, so we IDs cannot use dynamic, the IDs. But yeah. the, and the names are also same. Yeah. Right. And, so and somehow the two of the buttons got interchanged by, uh, because of the developer or some, uh, some mistake. So in so, that case, so my question, I uh, coming, I'll answer it. But my question was, if you have four summit buttons, who actually cares if it actually changes? It's the same button, right? No, no, no. I mean, like the name is same. Just a, just an example. The name is same, but the functionality is oh, different. Oh, the functionality may yeah, be different. Yeah, the functionality but the name of the button is different. Yeah. Okay. First thing is, I would say that's a terrible coding there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I don't know if they were in the last session, but we were talking about product managers and business people, so. First, that has to be really fixed, no matter what tool you use. And next thing was coming to the AI aspect of it. So what happens is, yeah, as and when you keep running the test, it starts gathering data. If it sees that, okay, all these IDs are changing dynamically, then it starts learning, right? And uh, again, only based on the amount of data and amount of times you run, 
the AI is going to learn. So after a certain period of time, it will start detecting, detecting these changes and start self-healing, which means that it's going to detect all these changes, even though the IDs are dynamically changing and everything is the same. So it is going to becoming smarter, it's going to, it'll become smarter and start trying to identify all these changes and then work properly. But even if you do use AI, it's going to take some time for it to learn. Um, but I would first say is go to your developers and business people to actually change it. But to answer your question, yes, the AI can do it, but it will take a lot of test runs and then more data to do it, right? So only once we have that scenario and keep running it, then we'll start learning about stuff. So, so hopefully that kind yeah, of answers answer your question yeah, because but it's hard. Then uh, is there any plan like uh, if you uh, if you click any button, then right. the page that renders after it, I mean, is there any plan of, you know, is there any way, I mean, maybe you have some uh, plan of uh, implementing that into your AI application, I mean, uh, what happens after a button is clicked, uh, the DOM that is uh, rendered, maybe that can also be used later on to identify what is the functionality of the button. Right, so we already do that. So for every um, element we interact with, we take screenshots and uh, um, AI already knows what's the next thing which is supposed to come. So for example, you're clicking on that same example summit button and if say a different page was supposed to display, it already has taken the screenshot and if it's failing, it's going to keep looking, why is this page not coming, right? So let's start learning. So the point is that is already implemented. So it is going to detect that DOM change and make sure the right page gets displayed based on the click. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry guys, we are out of time. Oh. I'm so sorry. sorry. Okay. But Raj is really? going to be here and we can definitely reach out to him. Oh outside. yeah, and uh, the t-shirts a... here. And uh, we're going to take a picture as well once you get the t-shirt, so. And I'm going to stay here, so feel free to ask me questions. So thank you. Yeah. Appreciate Thanks it. everyone. Thanks Raj.